All right, so uh, welcome back. Um, this section, we're going to mainly focus on model assessment. So trying to determine how, like the quality, basically the quality of our output. So of a, and, of, and of our predictions. Uh, note that this is a very important part of the process. It's important to quantify the predictive power of your model. Um, all, model all models are going to have some error. There's no models that are 100% correct. Um, but obviously, we have to have a certain qu level quality before that model is deemed to be useful or valuable in any way. Um, again, if you put a lot of garbage in, you're going to get garbage out. So it's important to think through this whole process. So how do you um, create a model? How do you train it well, give it good predictor variables, optimize it, which we'll talk about later, and then hopefully you'll get a decent prediction as will be shown from your model assessment. We're going to mainly look at how we assess three kind of different types of output. We're going to look at first assessing categorical or classification type outputs. Uh, second, we're going to look at how we, pr how we assess um, continuous, numeric outputs, like regression outputs. And lastly, we'll look at uh, probabilistic outputs. Okay, so traditionally, um, accuracy assessment for classification is done with an error or confusion matrix. So uh, here you're actually utilizing your validation data. So you're going to let the algorithm classify the validation samples and then try to determine how good of a job it did at assessing those unbiased randomized validation samples. So traditionally with an error matrix, the reference or validation data make up the columns and what they were called by the algorithm or classification model make up the rows. So um, for example, all of these samples in this column were forest, so they were validated to be forest. These are pasture, land, or grass, barren, crop, developed, or water. All the, in contrast, all of the cells or pixels or features in this row were, were called forest, whether they were forest or not. These were called grass, whether they were grass or pasture or not. These were called barren, if they were barren or not, so on and so forth, right? So, the diagonal represents the correct answers. So these cells were forest and they were called forest. These cells were pasture grass and they were called pasture grass. These cells were barren and they were called barren. These were crop, they were called crop. These were developed, they were called developed, so on and so forth. All the off diagonals are incorrect classifications. So these ones were pasture grass, but they were incorrectly called forest. Uh, let's see, where, where do we see some error? This one, um, let's see, I'm trying to find one with there, this one. So uh, these ones were pasture grass, but they were incorrectly called developed instead. Uh, these ones were incorrectly, were pasture grass, but they were incorrectly called cropland. Okay, so effectively what you're doing here is you're creating a contingency table, error matrix, confusion matrix, we're comparing the correct answer to what it was called in terms of categories. Again, the diagonal is correct, and all the off-diagonals di are wrong. So to get a percent that's correct, you just basically sum the diagonal and divide by the sum of the entire table. Um, this is the actual validation for this map. So we created random samples, looked at those samples, determined what they were, and compared them with the algorithm called them, and created this confusion matrix. Okay, so from an error or confusion matrix, there are many different measures that can be calculated. Uh, first off, you can calculate overall accuracy, and that's just simply the number of features correctly classified, basically the diagonal, divided by all of the features, or the sum of the entire table. And then if you multiply that by 100, it'll be a percentage, so it'll be somewhere between 0 and 100%. Um, you can also look at accuracies that are specific to a specific class, as opposed to the entire classification overall. Um, user's accuracy is calculated as the number of features of a specific class that were categorized correctly divided by the row total. So summing across the rows. That's times 100. Um, and then the producer's accuracy is the correct divided by the column total for that class times 100. Here's a little exp a little more additional explanation associated with users and producers accuracy. So again, users accuracy um, is this is the equation: the correct divided by the row total for that class, 
Um, that's considered a measure of commission error. So basically it was included in the incorrect class. Uh, prob- so it's the probability that a feature classified on the map actually represents that category. Um, and then the producer's accuracy is omission error. And that, so it, was, it wasn't included in the correct class. And that's the probability of a, fee- of a reference feature being correctly classified. Again, to divide by the column total. So generally, whenever we talk about overall accuracy, we can just get one measure there, the overall accuracy, the, the diagonal sum divided by the sum of the table. And then for any specific class, we can calculate error across the rows or down the columns. So if we, if we go down across the rows, that's user's accuracy, is, which is a measure of omission error. If we look at um, down the columns, that's producer's error, accuracy, a measure of omission error. Um, one issue with this is that sometimes you can just get things right by random chance. So, for example, imagine if you had an area that was 100% forest, um, or not, sorry, let's say 90% forest. If you called the entire map forest, it'd be so 100% forest, but it was 90, then it's like 90% right. But that doesn't mean that it's very useful. So, one measure that's commonly calculated for um, for uh, assessing classification accuracy is the kappa statistic or Cohen's kappa. So the idea here is to adjust the accuracy for chance agreement. So just getting it, getting it right by random chance. So again, you can think about this as a adjustment of overall accuracy based on random chance. Here is the equation for it. Note that you don't need to hand calculate this. We can calculate this directly in, um, in R. Um, generally speaking, this should be calculated because it does take out that random trans component. However, you should, it should be noted that there's been recently some arguments about whether or not this is still a good measure. Um, however, it is generally calculated especially and is used especially in remote sensing. Okay, so here's an example of, a, of an error matrix just to finish this off. So to calculate overall accuracy, you would sum the diagonal, divide by the sum of the entire table. Here you can see that we've calculated users and producers accuracy. Users was across the row, producers down the column. So this gives you some additional information about not just overall accuracy, but accuracy within a specific class. Um, so for, for example, it seems like our lowest accuracies in terms of producers was really with our cropling class and our develop class, whereas water and forest were generally pretty good. So again, that that's a little bit extra detail that may be a value, especially if you're interested in a specific class or category it, relative to others. Here's another example with fewer categories. This is just uh, two classes, forest or not forest. So again, this is the corrects. These are the incorrects, and we have producers' accuracies for both classes and users' accuracies for both classes. Okay, so how do you actually calculate an error matrix or confusion matrix in R? Um, so there's a couple different ways to do it. If you want to do it from scratch, if you have the correct answers as a vector and the predictions as a vector, you can coerce them into a table and then calculate directly from a table. But fortunately, it's actually easier than that when we are using caret because there's, uh, there's uh, functions built in to calculate this directly. Uh, the confusion matrix function in caret does, um, creates a confusion matrix. So it requires two arguments, the predicted class from the model, so the prediction, and then the actual class, the correct answer. And then from that, it will build a confusion matrix. Note that when you build a confusion matrix, it will also automatically calculate some of these uh, producers, users, over accuracies, and uh, whatnot, and cap, I believe. Um, there's also another version, confusionmatrix.train. So whenever you do um, k-fold cross-validation, you can actually build a confusion matrix from the withheld data in each fold, um, or in each validation step, so the withheld fold. Um, we'll talk about that later. Um, note that this isn't to... This isn't supposed to be used to compare to the um, to the validation data, but to some of the training data um, using withheld data, the k-fold. Um, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense unless your data are random in some way and unbiased. Um, if you want to create a confusion matrix outside of um, caret, 
you can use uh, and, and specifically calculate the kappa statistic. You can do that using the cap function, um, which is part of the EPA display package. So basically, you have to produce a table. The first argument will be the predicted classes from the table, and the second, or from the model, and the second argument will be the actual classes. So the validation. And then um, from that, you can calculate kappa over accuracy, and it will produce a confusion matrix. Um, if you're going to work in Carrot, I would suggest the confusion matrix function. It's very easy to use, uh, very powerful, and it works well with the model outputs. Okay, so now we're going to move on and look at ways in which we can potentially assess the accuracy not of a categorical output, but of a continuous or numeric output, so like a regression type output. Uh, we're mainly going to look at RMSE, um, R squared, adjusted R squared, and I'll mention AIC. Okay, so first off, we're going to look at RMSE, or root mean square error. Uh, root mean square error is pretty simple. It's just simply the square root of the average of the of the residuals, right? Uh, average, sorry, average of the square residuals. So how does this work? Well, basically, you take the actual value. So track from it the predicted value. Generally, if you have a hat above something in statistics, that means it's predicted. So this is the residual, the difference between the actual value and the predicted value. So for all of our samples, we calculate the residual, we square them, sum them up, divide by the number of samples, and take the square root. Um, the output of this, RMSE, root mean square error, will be in the units of y of what you're predicting. So if you're predicting percentage, it'll be in percentage. If you're predicting length, it'll be in length. If you're predicting parts per million, it'll be in parts per million. Um, so um, it's in the units. The lower the RMSE, the better. Um, the higher, obviously, the worst, right? You can also calculate uh, mean square error, which is basically just root mean square error without the, without the root part, without taking the square root. And in that case, it'll be in the square root of the uh, it'll it'll be in the units of the of, sorry it'll be in the square units of the of the of y. So if it, you were predicting parts per parts per billion, it'd be parts per billion squared. Okay, um, so this is a pretty common statistic. It's used to assess basically any type of continuous prediction. So regression, machine learning regression. If you're in remote sensing you or GIS, you've probably seen this used to assess the, the results of um, a georeferencing operation. And what all those things have in common is that they're assessing a continuous output. Okay, another way that we can assess the... Um, that we can assess a continuous output is R squared. Um, and this is a fairly common statistic you've seen if you've worked in Excel or anything and have used like uh, regression. So R squared is the total sum of squares minus the residual sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares. Um, the total sum of squares is basically the sum of all the values minus the mean value squared. So it's the sum of the squares of the uh, values minus the mean values in the data set. So that in this case is going to be the denominator. And then in the numerator, we take that value, subtract from it the residual sum of squares, which is effectively just the square sum of the residuals. So now instead of subtracting the average y value from each value, you're subtracting the predicted or y hat value, so the predicted value for that value. So what this basically gives you back is the proportion of variance in y explained by the model. And if you look at the equation, that should make some sense. So total sum of squares is basically a measure of the total variance. So the residual sum of squares is the portion of that variance that was not explained. So if you take the total sum of squares and subtract a residual from it, you're going to get the proportion of the variance that was explained. If you divide that by the total variance, again here, sum of squares, then that's going to give you back the proportion of the variance explained. So generally, this is on a scale of 0 to 1, 1 meaning all the variance is explained by the model, which frankly doesn't really happen that often, and 0 meaning none was explained. So the higher the R squared value, the better. One issue with R squared um, when you're doing multiple regression or anytime you have multiple predictor variables, so even if you're doing machine learning and you're using multiple predictor variables in machine learning, um, R squared um, um, must be adjusted in order to be accurate. 
Um, so basically, R squared is going to always increase when you add predictor variables, even if they're not really helping that much. So we have to adjust for it. So this is the equation for adjusted R squared. So it takes into account um, n, the sample size, so the number of samples, like training data, for example, and p, which is the number of variables, number of predictor variables. So again, you this should be applied any time you're creating a model that has more than one predictor variable or more than one x. Another measure that we commonly see um, for assessing a continuous prediction is Akiki's Information Criterion, or AIC. So this is a measure relative quality of statistical models for a given data set. Uh, low values suggest a better model, so lower is better. Um, you can use this to assist in model selection, so different predictor variable, space, feature space, for example. Um, and then AIC provides a correction for finite sample size, where you have a limited number of training samples. Um, this is the equation for that. Note it relies on maximum likelihood functions and whatnot. Um, here's the correction for the C component, um, the, the um, finite sample size correction. Uh, note we won't really use this much, um, but I wanted to mention it because you may see this come up, especially in the context of regression and multiple regression. OK, so how can you actually calculate some of these things? Um, um, in R, this can be the RMSE can be calculated using the metrics package. Um, here is the, the link to the metrics package. Um, so you can calculate many measures for regression-based analyses like MSC and RMSC and whatnot. So this is actually pretty simple. Um, you, inside the metrics package, there is a function called RMSE. If you give it the actual values, the correct answers, and the predicted, then it will calculate the RMSC for you. Um, note that this is a pretty simple prediction. So if you're good in R, you could also just write a function or a set of um, a set of code to create RMSC for you. But this works, so I would highly recommend just using this uh, function. Uh, make sure though you give it what it needs to to give you back the right answer. Um, Note that as we talked about just through the last few slides here, there are lots of options for assessing regression type models, um, but we're mainly going to rely on RMSE um, in, our, in our examples and in class um, because it's fairly easy to implement and it works good, it works well using it when you're comparing multiple machine learning or different classification methods. Okay, so now we're going to look at ways in which you could assess not, a, not just a um, uh, regression type or continuous output or categories, but a probabilistic output. Um, one method that's commonly used to assess or these type of measurements are the receiver operating characteristic or ROC curves and the AUC statistic, which gets calculated from them. Okay, so this requires some explanation because it's a little bit more conceptual than maybe some of the other techniques we've looked at here. Okay, so basically to calculate um, to, to create an, a receiver operating characteristic curve and the AUC major, it's based on the true positive rate and the false positive rate. So effectively, four things can happen when you have a binary classification and you're trying to predict probabilities. So these curves represent that, and this represents a specific threshold or cutoff. So if we were using this value, um, this probability score, what would, how would things be proportioned? Okay, so the true positive rate is pretty simple. That's just the fraction of the cases that were predicted as true that actually were true. So um, they were true, and we were correctly saying that they are true. Um, and the uh, false positive rate is the fraction of cases predicted as true that were actually false. So that would be this set here um, versus this set, which would be the true positive rate. Um, the false negative are ones that were actually, that were, um, let's see here, false negative. So... Oh, sorry, this is way. So we'll start with true negative. So the true negative is the ones that were wrong and were called wrong. So false and were called false. Whereas the false negative were true, but they were called false. So in short, there's basically four things that can happen when you pick a prob probability threshold to calculate whether something is something or isn't. It could 
be true and be called true, so true positive. It could be um, it could be uh, uh, it could be. Let's see here. Yeah, um, I don't think the simplest way to say this. It could so it could be true and be called true. It could be false and be called false. It could be true but be called false, or it could be false but be called true. Right. And as you note here, this is those proportions will change if you move this line. Right. So if we move this line over further, we're going to have um, we're going to have a uh, a lower true positive rate, so on and so forth. So. That's what makes prob probabilities kind of complicated is that it's not just one threshold you're trying to compare. It's across this whole range as if you shifted this probability back and forth. So how would these proportions change? Okay, so that's effectively what an ROC curve does. So here's an example of an ROC curve. So on the x-axis, you're plotting specific specificity. So it's 1 minus the false positive rate. So one minus the um, false ones that were actually called positive, right? And then the y-axis is sensitivity, which is effectively the true positive rate. So what you do is you plot that curve at all of the different probability thresholds. So again, if we go back to this, you're effectively moving this bar back and forth. And that's what creates this curve. So generally, the higher up this curve is, the better the result will be. So to actually assess that like numerically, we can calculate a value which is based on the area under this curve. And that is called area under curve or the AUC value. So we calculate the area under curve or AUC value for the ROC curve. So the receiver operating characteristic curve AUC value. Generally speaking, the larger the value, the better. So the highest possible is 1, where all the area of the graph is under the curve. So it basically hugs the line. And then obviously down to 0 0.5. 0 0.5 is basically like a random guess. Your model isn't really doing much better than random. Generally, these types of models are assessed very similar to how you would uh, look at a college grading scale. So if you're above a 90, that's considered pretty good, A. 8.8, 10 to 0.9 is a B, 0.7 to 0.8 is a C, so on and so forth until you get down to very low scores. So again, you want a high AC, um, uh, AUC value approaching 1, hopefully above 9, 0.9 or maybe at least above 0.8, and this line should be hu hugging this side as opposed to going down towards this uh, center line, which is like a random model, which is not very predictive at all. Um, as a side note, people that work a lot with probabilistic type models, they'll use these types of outputs, but they'll also um, use the kind of categorical pr um, um, assessments too, like HAPA and overall accuracy. Um, the issue though is that when you're using those HAPA or overall accuracy type uh, pr um, measures, um, you're really only looking at one threshold or probability cutoff at a time, whereas the AUC allows you to look across all of the different uh, cutoffs and thresholds. Okay, so if you want to calculate an ROC curve in the AUC statistic in R, there are some packages for doing that. The one that I like the most is PROC package. Um, here's just some examples of that. So the ROC function creates the ROC curve. You have to give it the response, so the cur the correct answer and then the predictor, so um, uh, so uh, what it was predicted to be. And that'll create an ROC curve. Plot.ROC will actually plot an ROC curve using the base uh, plot functions in R so you can view it. Calling AUC on ROC output from the ROC function will give you the AUC statistic. Um, one thing you may want to do is to actually compare statistically to uh, two AUC values. That can be accomplished using the ROC.test function. So what that does is it calculates a statistical test to determine the difference between two AUC values. So that would be a good way to assess or compare to, um, to uh, probabilistic models. Okay, so the next part of this uh, uh, chapter or the um, lecture is going to focus on uh, parameter optimization. So 
again, trying to get the best output we can from one of these machine learning algorithms may require us to actually try to optimize the user-defined parameters. So that's what we're going to talk about now. Okay, so here's a table um, from that uh, machine learning review article that um, Dr. Warner and, and Fong and myself put together. So um, what this shows is some of the different parameters that are required for different machine learning algorithms. So for example, k nearest neighbor just requires k, the number of neighbors. I mean, you could change the distance metric if you wanted, but you definitely have to select a k. Um, Neural networks generally require a good bit. Um, here's some examples for a multi-layer perception artificial neural network with back propagation. Again, we're not really looking much at neural networks here. Um, decision trees, you generally have to have the pruning parameter, like the CP parameter with R part. Uh, boosted decision trees, um, you need the number of um, iterations or trees, so the number of trees you're going to use to produce the ensemble. Um, for random forest, you generally have to specify the number of trees in the forest and also the number of variables randomly sampled as candidates at each split, so the number of random predictor variables available. Um, support vector machines, if you're using a polynomial, polynomial kernel, will require a, an order for the polynomial and also the C or slack parameter. And then if you're using a radial basis function for, with SVM, you're going to have to specify gamma if you're doing classification, epsilon for regression, and also the cost or slack parameter. Okay, so you may be wondering, well, is this really necessary? Um, and really, there's no easy answer to that question. I think that really comes down to what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do, what you're trying to model, the features you're using, so on and so forth. Um, here's an example of assessing... Um, model performance using different um, polynomial orders and with different training sizes and and then this is showing um, let's see here this is the gamma for RBF and this is from a paper by Hong and others in 2002 so as you can see here you do see some variability in the classification accuracy with changing the order the, P, the, the polynomial order or the RBF gamma parameter. Um, so this would suggest yes, but you can find other situations where it wouldn't matter. Um, even in my own work, I've, I've done stuff, I've, in some of my studies, I've noted issue or improvements, and others I've noted marginal improvements, and others I've seen little to no improvement. So in short, I would suggest that if you're really trying to get the best accuracy you can, your only real option is to try to optimize the algorithm and see if it actually does improve anything. Okay, so what are the methods for doing this? Um, so we're going to look at a few methods here. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the more common methods that are used. So method one is holdout method. So basically in this case, the data are split into training and testing. The model is created on the training samples, and the model is then tested on the test samples. So the parameters that provide the best prediction of the test samples, not the training samples, are used. This is nice because you have two separate sets of data. You have a training sample and you have a, and you have a held out test sample. Um, so there's no overlap or reuse of the data. Um, this is probably the best way to do it, but the problem is that a lot of times we, hit, we have a limited number of samples. So if you have to hold out a certain set of samples to test the algorithm, then that means you have less samples available for training, which is not optimal. So if you have an abundance of data, this can be a way to do it, but if you're, you don't want to limit the number of training samples you have, generally we can't use this method. So there are other methods that we could potentially pursue if we have a limited number of samples. Okay, so one way we could do it is leave one out cross-validation, or um, that's L-O-O-C. Sometimes you'll see it written that way. So in this case, the model's trained on all the samples but one. The hell out sample is then predicted. This is ran k times, where k is equal to the number of samples, n. And then you calculate an average error, and then parameters that provide the best average prediction of the withheld samples are used. So effectively, you're training on all the samples but one, seeing how well it predicts the withheld sample, doing that such that all, all of the samples are held out, and then seeing the, and trying to obtain the best accuracy based on the parameters. Um, I generally don't use this method. I think there are, are better methods. You do see this used occasionally with, uh, K, excuse me, with K nearest neighbor.
Okay, so k-fold cross-validation is the method I tend to use the most. So this is how k-fold cross-validation works. So the data are randomly split into k-folds, so like 5-fold cross-validation, k would be 5. 10-fold cross-validation, cross k would be 10. We commonly see 10 or 5 um, as our folds. So the model is created using k minus 1 fold, so all the folds but 1, and is repeated, repeated k times, so that each fold is left out once. Parameters are assessed using the withheld fold each time the model is ran. The parameters that provide the best average prediction of the withheld fold are used. So basically the idea here is that let's just use 10. So let's say you have 100 samples. So that means that you would break the data randomly into 10 uh, into 10 partitions or folds, then you would run the model 10 times. Each time, 10 of, 9 of those folds would be used and, the, and one would be held out, holding out a different one each time. Then you would look at how well it predicted that held out fold each time and take an average and as, to assess what parameters are best. One thing nice about k-fold cross-validation is it does a good job of making use of your data to both train the model and to, to optimize it. Um, so this is a good choice if you don't want to just hold, leave things out and not use them as training. A kind of a, um, ex expanded version of k-fold cross-validation is k-fold cross-validation with repeats. Um, this is basically the same thing except you just create different sets of folds and run them in, in repetition. So the beginning process is the same. So you split the data into k folds. You run models using k minus 1 or all but one of the folds. And you hold out one of those folds each time and assess on it. And then, again, the parameters are assessed using the withheld fold each time the models ran. So the processors repeated, so here's where it changes. So the processors repeated a fine number of times using different folds. And then the parameters that give you the best results using the held out folds is considered the best, um, the best optim the optimal parameters. So again, this is basically just k-fold cross-validation, but instead of just doing it with a set of, say, 10 folds, we do it with the set of 10 folds, and then we repeat it with a different set of 10 folds a certain number of times. So for example, if you did f um, f uh, 10 fold cross validation with five repeats, then that means that you would create 10 folds, run that 10 times holding out one fold, get the average, then you would do it 10, how many say, sorry, five more times with the different random folds. Um, so it just adds some more variability into the prediction. You might say, well, that sounds better, so we should just do that then, right? That's, that's better than just doing simple k-fold. Um, it could be better, but one of the issues is now you're having to do this more times, which means it's going to take longer. So it's going to take you longer to optimize your algorithm. Okay, another option is bootstrapping. Um, this term came up before when we were talking about random forest. So the idea here is random sampling with replacement. So here's how it works. So the data are split into a training and test set. So two-thirds to train, one-third to test. This is, this is repeated multiple times using different random training test splits. The parameters that provide the best average prediction of the withheld data are used. Okay, so K, this might sound a lot like k-fold cross-validation, but it's different because with k-fold, you have mutually exclusive folds, right? So the data can't be reused. In this case, you're saying, let's train on two-thirds of the data and assess on one-third of the data, and we'll do this so many times, and we'll just randomly shuffle. Since this is bootstrapping, it, you could have some data be used for training multiple times, or testing multiple times, or training all the time, or testing multiple times. The point is they're not mutually, mutually exclusive. They do overlap some. Um, what's the benefit to this versus k-fold? I don't know that there really is benefits one way or the other. Um, generally, if I'm going to do these type of processes, I use k-fold, k-fold with repeats, or bootstrapping. Um, I think these are better methods and leave one out. Um, again, holdouts is a good way to do it, but the problem there is um, your reduction in training data. Okay, so how are you actually, so that's how you are assessing it, but how are you 
well, how are you actually choosing what parameters to actually assess? So generally how we do this is with what's called a grid search. So let's imagine we have an algorithm with two parameters. So we one parameter can be set to A, B, C, or D, and the other parameter can be set as A, 2, 3, 4, 5. So what we need to do here is actually test every combination. So A and 1, B and 1, C and 1, D and 1, A and 2, B and 2, so on and so forth. So what you're doing is testing all possible combination of the parameters as a grid. So what a grid search does then is it goes through all these combinations and it uses one of these methods, make like k-fold, bootstrapping, k-fold with repeats, and it actually tests all of these different parameters and then whatever gives the highest overall, whatever measure you're looking at, will be considered the best parameters and you'll use those in your final model. So if only one parameter is being assessed, all the specified values will be tested. So if we didn't have 1 through 5, we just had A through D, we just have to test A through D, we would need, or need the combinations. If multiple parameters are being assessed, then you will need to test every combination of parameters, and that's done using this grid search method. Um, one problem with this is that as you increase the number of parameters and the number of options for each parameter, the number of combinations increases pretty drastically, which means you're going to have to test a lot of different things which means that it could take a long time. So um, there are some limitations to this. Um, I've done optimization before this taken over a day. Um, generally, this can be the longest of the processes, more so than even running the model, produ producing the model, or um, predicting with it. So uh, again, what method should you use? So some things to consider is the number of training samples available. If you have a limited training samples, that kind of throws out um, the holdout uh, option. Um, what algorithm that, you're be that is being tuned, SVM, random force, so on and so forth. The number of tuning parameters, the number of values that you want to assess for each of those parameters the time and computational requirements for doing the tuning. Again, generally, I like k-fold cross-validation, repeated k-fold, or bootstrapping for the type of work I do. Um, these are the type of processes that, again, can take some time. So if you've got a large data set or you're testing a lot of parameters, it might be a good idea to like let this run overnight or something, and then hopefully it'll be done when you come back in the morning and you can use your new optimized settings. Um, just as a side note, there are other ways to do algorithm optimization that aren't based on these methods or grid searches, such as using genetic algorithms, um, but we're not talking about those here. Okay, so another question is what is actually optimized? So what are you actually trying to um, to optimize? So you know, again, for K, it's generally the K or the number of neighbors. You can maybe, again, change the distance uh, me metric if you wanted. For decision trees, it's generally the complexity or pruning parameter. So with our part, that would be CP. Uh, for boosted decision trees, it's generally the number of trees. For random forest, it's generally the number of trees and the M try or the number of random variables. A note for random forest, the number of trees generally, it's not super sensitive to that. You can just use a large number and then optimize on the M for M try if you want. Um, SVM can be somewhat complicated to um, optimize because there's a large number of samples you could try. Again, you're going to probably want to optimize the cost parameter for um, for ra radial basis function, it'd be gamma for regression, and then epsilon for the for, or sorry, gamma for classification, epsilon for regression, polynomial order for polynomials. Um, okay, and then another thing might be what range of values. Um, if you look through the literature, you'll find different numbers, but here are some suggestions. So for K, it might be one through twenty, so one up to twenty nearest neighbors. CP is generally pretty easy. It's scaled 0 to 1. Um, boosted decision trees may be 10 to 1,000 trees. Random force may be also, t or sorry, 10 to 10,000 trees. Random force similar 10 to 10,000 trees. Um, rarely will you probably need more than 1,000 trees, but you could always test more. Again, larger Larger, more trees mean it's going to take longer to run, so there are some there's some trade off there. And then M tries one to the number of variables available. So if you have 20 predictor variables, you could test one through 20. If you got like 200 predictor variables, you could just instead of doing every combination, one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth, you could do like every four. So like four, eight, 12, 16, so on and so forth. For SVM, that's probably the one that's hardest to determine what parameters to test. 
Um, C, I generally see range ranges of 10 to the negative second to 10 to the second. Um, and then gamma, generally 10 to the negative fourth to 10 to the second. But if you look around, I'm sure you'd find some different numbers there. Okay, so how do you do optimization with caret? Um, so this is built into the train control, which I mentioned earlier. So you set this up within train control. If you set that to a variable, then you can call that in the model and use your training um, process there. So here's what a train control uh, function uh, would look like. So here I'm using train control as the function. I'm saving it to an object called train control, which I could again call in in the model later to actually do the optimization. The method is the methods being used, cross-validation, bootstrapping, repeated cross-validation, so on and so forth. Number, in this case, is the number of folds, so we're using tenfold. Um, and then uh, verbose iteration is equal to true. That That's just a command that you can use to make it actually print as it goes so you can see how it's progressing. Again, that might be, you might not need to do that, but it's not necessarily a bad idea because it does give you a sense of how long it's going to take. Uh, methods available within um, Kara to do uh, the optimization is bootstrapping, which would be specified as boot. Kfold cross validation is CV, specified there. Repeated Kfold cross validation is repeated CV. Leave one out as LOO CV, and then there are some other options. Um, the number parameter defines the number of folds or number of resampling iterations um, for um, for bootstrapping or for K, um, um, cross validation, and then if you are doing repeats, then that specifies the number of repeats. If you're doing repeated Kfold cross validation, so if I go up here, if I inserted in a repeats is equal to five, then it would be do ten fold cross validation five times. If you don't specify, and also I'd have the changes to repeated CV. Um, so anyway, so those are your options. So once you've set that up, you can specify within train a couple things. So again, how do you specify what values you actually want to test? Uh, one simple way to do it is just to set a tune length. So here I set the tune length to 10. So that means it's going to try 10 values for the thing that needs optimized for k and n, which in this case would be k. If you have more than one parameter, it'll, be, it'll do 10 of each. Another way you can do it is actually instead of just letting it select the number of of parameters to try is you can actually specify a list of parameters to try and that can be done with this tune grid option so here we have this um, we're creating a grid using expand.grid and we're using values for k of 3 5 7 9 11 13 and 15 so um, then we can call we can call tune grid is equal to k grid and that will give you back this list of values so in short you can use tune grid to specify the exact values that you want to test and you can use tune length to just say try 5, 10, 20 values, whatever. Again, the, the longer the list of values you, tr you try, the longer it's going to take. Another thing you can specify is what you're actually, what metric you're using to try to determine uh, what uh, what parameters gave you the best calculation. So here we're using kappa for a classification. So the optimal parameters will be the one that provides the best kappa, the highest kappa parameter. Note here the TR control, that sets the controls, and that references back to your the, the tuning controls you, we set up in the prior slide. Um, so what are you optimizing for? Again, um, this kind of depends on what is your mapping. So um, what you can summarize for depends on the sum function and the train control, so what's available there. So for a multi-class summary, like a like land cover classification, you can generally op optimize for overall accuracy or for the corrected kappa, you know, chance adjusted. If you're doing a two-class summary, you can use sensitiv sensitivity specific specificity or the, a or the AUC value from the AUC curves. So that would, might be useful if you're trying to look at more of a probabilistic output. Um, again, some other options. So again, classification, you can do kappa or accuracy. Probabilities, you can do ROC. Random forest, because it has that out-of-bag error built into it, which is kind of unique compared to other algorithms. You could optimize on o OBB. Regression, you can use R squared or root mean square error. Um, so here's another example of a model 
Again, where we're setting it up, we're predicting class with all the other columns in the table. The table name is train. We're using k nearest neighbor. We're going to test 10 values for k. We're going to center and scale the data. We're going to use our, our train controls as specified in this train control object. We need to be specified earlier. And then we're going to optimize on the kappa metric. Um, one thing you may be concerned about if you're using these techniques like in a research context is reproducibility. So a lot of these techniques have some randomness built into them. So if you run it multiple times, you might get different answers. Um, so what if you wanted to get the same folds each time, um, you know, like a tenfold cross-validation so that if you gave it to somebody, they'd get the exact same answer? Well, how you can generally do that is by setting a random seed. So if you want to make your results reproducible, you can set a random seed. Um, generally, you'll need to do this before each step that, that you want to make reproducible, so any step that has a random component. Um, unfortunately, at the beginning of your code, you just can't set a random seed, and it will be honored throughout. It has to generally be set before any process where there's some random component. So you might have to re replicate this multiple times. Fortunately, it's easy. It's just set.seed, and you specify a number, which is a random seed. So again, that adds, makes your results reproducible. Okay, so um, the rest of this um, is just some odds and ends that you might want to consider if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts of um, making machine learning models and making the best models you can. Um, so what we're going to look at initially is variable selection. So um, selecting predictor variables that are predictive or important. Sometimes just simply removing redundant or unnecessary predictor variables can actually improve your model. Sometimes you're just interested in finding the variables that are most useful um, for predicting the thing you're trying to predict. Okay, so um, why is this an issue? So this was documented in what's known as the Hughes phenomenon or curse of dimensionality, which was originally mentioned in this, pa this paper by Hughes from 1968. Um, so on the mean accuracy of statistical pattern recognition. So as you can see here, this is plotting the number of features on the x-axis versus the classification error rate on the y-axis. So with a large sample, um, in this case we have 1,000 samples, the accuracy kind of eventually just kind of uh, levels off. So you're not seeing any improvement as you um, increase the number of features. And that might just simply be because some of these features just aren't that useful. So you basically maxed out what you can get from the data. So that's super. That's not super interesting. But what is more interesting is this upper line. So this is with a smaller set of training data, only 100 training samples. So here we can see that uh, we have a decrease or, or um, a decrease in error or an increase in accuracy up to a point, but then as we increase the number of features further, we actually have more error. And that seems counterintuitive because you would think that if you gave a computer more information, then it's going to be able to do a better job. But the trade-off here is that as you give the computer more examples, then it's got a more complicated feature space that it has to understand and work within. So even though it has more data, it has more complexity. So this increased complexity is not really being offset by the increase in information. Um, so how you could maybe deal with that issue is just not include some of these extra features or provide additional training data. So, you know, it takes more training data to fully define a, um, a more complex feature space. So in short, there are some logical, um, practical reasons why you, you may want to remove features from your, um, from your uh, modeling process. There are kind of two broad ways that we can remove uh, features. One is known as feature selection. So that's pick from the currently available features. So if you have features, as we see here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, we can use some method to pull out the most useful features, A, D, and H, in this case. Um, another option is feature reduction. So this is creating new features from the original features. So you're not going to actually get back the original features, but some transformed version of them in which they're summarized in a smaller set of features. And a good example of this is principal component analysis. Okay, so in R, there are some, and in, uh, in Carrot specifically, there are some methods available to do uh, feature elimination or feature selection. One of those is recursive feature elimination, which is implemented in R part. 
So basically how this works is the model's fitted to all the predictor variables, so all x's. Um, each predictor is then ranked using its importance in the model. And then you basically just subset out based on importance. Um, some of the, there's different methods available for doing this inside of Carrot. Um, some of them rely, rely on the importance measures that are made available through Random Forest. So effectively, it's trying to assess the importance of variables and subsetting out the most important ones. And then subsequently, you can run your model just on the important variables. So here's an example of how that would be implemented in code. So we set a random seed to make it um, repeatable. Um, we create this object fs con control, so feature selection control, um, using a function rfe control, so um, recursive feature elimination control. We're using this specific function. There's a couple different ones. We're using cross validation with ten folds to assess them. And what are we assessing? Well, we're going to assess. Um, 1 through 147 by 5. So it would be 1, 6, so on and so forth. And then it goes through all those numbers of features and then it pulls back the one that provides the best accuracy. So the number of features that provides the best accuracy. And then if we want then we can actually subset out those features. Um, so here we're running the test and we could then run the model just using the subset of the features that were found to be most useful. Um, another option which I like is implemented in a package called RF Utilities, and this is after uh, Murphy and all from 2010. So this is based on Random Forest and the variable importance within Random Forest. So it uses a Random Forest algorithm to select important variables. And then once you find the important variables, you can subset those out to use in your model. So again, there's multiple options here. Again, feature reduction, you're not selecting from the currently available features. Instead, you're trying to subset out features that or create new features um, in a new feature space. One example of that is principal component analysis or PCA. So this is an orthogonal transformation of the data where effectively you're trying to decorrelate the data. So you're trying to create new um, new data layers that are non-correlated versions of the original data. So it converts in correlated variables into in uncorrelated variables. Um, the idea here is that variance is information. So you're trying to um, measure or I guess, uh, um, yeah, I guess I think measured probably be a good term. Um, I guess maybe summarize the variability in your variables in a smaller subset of variables, I guess would be a good way to say it. Uh, generally, variability and data are described in a small number of principal components, thus you reduce the number of needed variables. So even though you produce in, uh, cor you produce in uncorrelated variables from in correlated variables, you're not going to need all those variables to actually um, uh, fully describe the variability in the feature space. So that's you're reducing the number of variables. Um, this is done using an eigenvector and, and an eigenmatrix. So you basically have some input variables and to get the principal components it's just a linear combination of those variables. So you multiply the value at that um, in that sample by a weight and then you add them all up and that gives you the principal components. So again, it's a linear combination. So these eigenvectors are like the coefficients that, allow, that go before each variable and you add those together to sum the principal component. So it's values needed to create principal components from a linear combination of the input variables. Um, generally, the first principal component explains the most variability and then it decreases from there. Um, again, explain variability decreases with increased principal component number. Um, this can be visualized in a uh, scree plot, and these can be produced in R. So again, this is the first principal component. It has the most variability, and you can see a reduction in the var variance as you go out to larger principal components. So we may not need these higher principal components to fully characterize the data. So if you want to do principal component analysis, um, that can be done in R. There are several different packages that implement this. Um, I like uh, PR, PR uh, comp um, function uh, with this in the default stats package in R. So basically what you do here is you call the 
call the comp or the PRC comp function, bring in the data, um, rescale the data, and then this will spit back the principal components, the rotation and whatnot will give you back the eigenvalues and the plot will give you the discrete plot and whatnot. Um, so, so anyway, that's one option for variable reduction. Another option is conical component analysis, and that is basically like principal component analysis except that the new variables are created using the class signatures. So you actually take into account the variability within the classes to make the components as opposed to just the data themselves. So the goal is to create a feature space in which the classes are more separable. Um, I don't use this a good bit, especially not in R, um, but it is an option. Okay, another thing you might be concerned about is balancing the training data. So um, this is this may or may not be an issue depending on the situation you're in, but this has been shown to have a pretty big impact on model accuracy, so it's worth considering. Okay, so what is the issue with unbalanced training data? Um, this is the key issue. So if the training data are not balanced, the algorithm may underpredict or poorly predict a less common class. So let's say, for example, and we'll just use a common but not spatial example of this, you're trying to predict, uh, again, fraud, um, fraud, fraudulent uh, purchases on credit cards or transactions. So again, the vast majority of credit card transactions are going to be um, legitimate transactions, and only a small proportion of them will be fraudulent transactions. So if you actually gave it a random sample, it's not going to see that many examples of fraudulent transactions, which is really what you're interested in. So the algorithm, if it's trying to optimize on just overall accuracy, the best it could maybe do is just say everything is not fraudulent. And even though that might be accurate, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily going to be useful. So what, so one way to deal with this issue of the poor performance of predicting uh, um, small classes is to try to balance the training data better. So an example in land cover mapping would be that you might have certain land cover categories that are not a large percentage of your data set or your study area, like small ponds or water or wetlands or something. So Given this issue, that means that those classes may be poorly predicted. So you may want to artificially increase their proportion in the training set relative to their true proportion in, on the ground or in the population. Um, how can we deal with this unbalanced training data? So one is you can use stratified random sampling. So select an equal number of training samples or roughly equal number of training samples in each category. Um, that's not always possible, especially if you don't have a lot of, um, like you don't have a wall-to-wall -wall map up front, for example. Another option is you could randomly undersample the majority class. Problem with that is that that's going to decrease your number of total samples, and as we've mentioned earlier, having a large set of training data is generally a good thing. Another option is that instead of reducing the number of more common samples is that you could duplicate the number of less common samples. So use your less common samples more than once in the model to try to balance it a bit. Another more complex option is to try to produce synthetic majority, um, sam uh, majority samples of the minority class. So um, try to create with some randomization and the available samples, it, new examples of the minority class to use. Um, luckily in Carrot, we have methods built in that allow us to implement that automatically uh, in the process. So inside of a, the train controls, um, using the sampling option, you can specify some sampling routines. Um, the down um, option would randomly subsample the more abundant class. Again, that's going to reduce your number of samples. The up method will randomly duplicate samples of the less abundant class, so just duplicating the less common of the classes. The, the smode method um, is uh, down samples the majority class and then synthesizes new minority instances by interpolating between existing ones. So again, it basically creates some new min min minority class samples um, using the original samples, but also with some randomization. So if you're having some issues trying to get you a, a non- uh, a, a small class to map correctly or to be predicted well, you may want to experiment with some of these sampling alteration methods. Okay, some pre-processing. Um, so this is so just to finish this off, um, you may there are some pre-processing routines that can be undertaken um, to prep your data before it goes into uh, the model. 
and this can be implemented directly in Carrot. So using the pre-process within the train, um, the pre-process um, parameter within train, you can specify some pre-processing. And I'm just going to pick out a few of these as examples. So for example, center subtracts the mean from the values and scale divides by the standard deviation. So we, if you have an algorithm like K nearest neighbor or like SVM, which is somewhat sensitive to scale, it's generally a good idea to center and scale the data. Range normalizes the data based on range. Um, 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 NZV removes values with a near zero variance. So if you have predictor variables where they're just not, not much variability and thus not much information, you can remove them. Core attempts to filter out variables that are highly correlated with each other. Um, PCA will produce principal components from the raw data. Um, and then uh, ICA produces independent components. So again, those may not be necessary based on whatever problem it is that you're trying to, um, to investigate, but they may be worth um, experimenting with. Um, center and scale, again, are some of the more common ones. So for example, K nearest neighbor and SVM require that. Um, Tree-based methods like um, random forest and decision trees and boosted decision trees uh, generally are not very robust to that. Or sorry, not they're not um, impacted by that greatly, so that may be less of an issue. Um, here's some code within a model, a train model, um, showing you how you could set up center and scale. So again, you just set this pre-pros argument, and then you're going to center and scale the data. Okay. So with that, that's the end of this. Um, this is supposed to be just kind of a crash course and how you can implement machine learning specifically on geographic data in R. So this is the background information and um, what we're going to do in lab is we'll sh I will show you some examples of how you can implement this for things like probabilistic prediction, regression, and classification. And you're going to work on some of this yourself and we'll play around with some of these um, specific issues like pre-processing, optimization, balancing, and whatnot. Um, so I hope you found this useful, and I hope you get the chance to really work around Carrot because it is a very uh, amazing, uh, powerful piece of software to um, implement machine learning. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, and I'll see you around.